Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Mr. Van Star is a very hard act to follow. Uh, I don't have his rich South European deep voice to put call order to everybody when you exceed your time, so I'd ask you to... I would ask you to have... Bear with me, be tolerant, don't over st shoot the runway, as I say, and keep your contributions uh, to the point. Now, uh, recent developments of regionalisation in Europe, that's where I'm starting. The question of the evolution of regionalisation is always high on the agenda of our Chamber of the Regions. Each year, new developments and new legislation have a direct impact on the competences of regions in a number of countries of the 47 member states of the Council of Europe. We have chosen several countries where important changes took place in the last years. We think it's important for our Chamber to be aware of the new developments. I would like to thank our speakers who have agreed to present a brief report on the evolution in their country. First, Mr. Ignacio Sanchez Amor will present a general introduction with special reference to developments in Spain. Then we will have statements on the situation in Austria, Greece, Italy, Poland and the Russian Federation and Sweden. Now, due to the large number of speakers, I would like to ask our speakers to be as brief as possible, as I said earlier, and the limit is between you each have five to ten minutes maximum. And uh, the uh, clock is behind me, and I'm sure the bell is near at hand. So, uh, I start off now. The uh, first speaker is uh, Mr. Mr. Sanchez Amor to introduce the subject. He is from Spain, he's Vice President of the Congress and a very active member of the Chamber of the Regions. He has broad experience on regionalization, not only in Spain, but in Europe in general. He represented our Chamber in several international conferences dealing with regionalization matters. So, Mr. Sanchez Amor, you have the floor. Ten minutes, please. Gracias, uh, William. Gracias Thank you very much, William. Thank you very much indeed to the organizers for allowing me to speak in Spanish because I'm just more comfortable speaking in my own language. Now, what I've been asked to do is give you a general overview of the situation to pave the way, if you like, for the subsequent keynote speakers. And what I'm going to talk about, therefore, are recent developments on this front. And what I want to do is give you a snapshot of the present situation, but you'll understand, of course, that in order to do so, I have to go back uh, into the past and tell you a little bit about trends in Spain. Now, first of all, one of the sources of regionalization in Europe is the identity of regions seeking to assert their cultural and historical identities, particularly in parts of Europe where nationalism has come to the fore. And the other reason for greater regionalization is in order to try and achieve greater legitimacy, greater effectiveness, and greater rationalization. So these essentially are the two drivers of the extensive regionalization of systems across the continent. Now, there have been two sources, therefore, of this drive towards regionalization, and often they merge. We have certain regions, for example, which have have come about as a result of devolution in a given state, and they may not have their own specific linguistic or cultural identity, but over time they certainly do and would take their place amongst those regions which have perhaps a more historical basis. I mean, we can be talking about Catalonia or Brittany, Scotland or wherever. There are, of course, these regions which have a strong cultural identity, but they also exist as regions in order to to implement policies more effectively. So we've got different root causes of this process of regionalization in Europe, but nevertheless, I think the situation is comparable from country to country, so I do think that in general terms you can 
characterize the 1980s as the golden age of regionalization in Europe. Now, this process, of course, was initiated at the end of the Second World War. We had nation states, however, who were somewhat fearful of other political players, and that is why we moved towards the so-called Europeanization of our political systems. We, of course, then had the influence of national and European decision-making systems, and that is why a lot of countries put in place regional economic planning units in order to better utilize the structural funds which they receive from the European Union. Now, in many cases, countries didn't have any kind of a regional structure. That was the case in Portugal, not so much the case in France. But regions, essentially, are the supreme political expression of the process in the 1980s. That is when the Assembly of European Regions came into being headed by President Puyol from Catalonia. They made huge efforts to try and develop European political links. In the 1990s, again, this was the high watermark, if you like, of the process of regionalization in Europe. Many regional systems were properly embedded in the European system. They were able to take part in meetings of Council of Ministers in the European Union. And there was a way in which many states in Europe sought to boost the powers and capabilities of the region. So regions were given greater presence, greater political presence, and greater powers in virtually all systems across the European Union. But I think that all too frequently there's a date that is rather overlooked in European history, namely 1998. Now, it was one country of Western Europe which expressly rejected regionalization in a referendum. In 1998, the Portuguese government decided to hold a referendum on regionalization, and when the people went to the ballot box, they turned down the idea of having regions. So for the first time, we had a specific rejection of the process of regionalization. So from this point on, from the end of the 1990s, so it's really the beginning of the previous decade, we found that this whole process tailed off slightly, it slowed down, it perhaps waned in importance. And Although regions had one greater regional weight, even though they had more presence in the European institutions, it was perhaps difficult for them to have the same level of powers as other institutions. Other countries, of course, have continued to regionalize. We have, of course, Germany, and we have the Constitutional Court, which via a number of rulings has to a certain degree, recentralize the system. We have Germany, which is a highly federalized system, but because of num a number of court rulings, a number of powers have been repatriated to the center. So this is a phenomenon, as I say, which we have witnessed even in highly developed federal structures such as Germany. The problem is, is that regions have failed to rise to the expectations which were generated in the 1990s. We We'll also have to take into consideration the economic crisis in looking at the fate of regions, because obviously the financial climate we are currently experiencing is hardly the most propitious for further development of the process of regionalization. Now, regions have won greater financial powers, and they are often responsible for the provision of public services. And most developed countries, such as Germany and Austria and Italy, for example, regions are responsible for providing most public services. The situation becomes more complicated when that situation leads to deterioration in quality or if there is a temptation to cut back on 
public spending, and I think that the present financial crisis is a huge threat to the process of regionalization in Europe. And later on, when my colleagues take the floor, I'm sure they will address the issue of the way in which public cuts are going to affect the process of regionalization. Now, just a word or two about Spain, if I may, William. From a political perspective, in recent years, we have seen a deepening of regionalization in Spain. We have a confederal type system. We have had a reform of the seven autonomous statutes, but there was previously a constitutional reform. So the political rationale behind this was that the state would reform in accordance with the rules essentially set by the autonomous communities. Our autonomous communities are on roughly the same footing as the German lender. So the autonomous communities that have been behind this drive towards greater regionalization. Many of them are historical regions, Catalonia, for example, Galicia, as well as the Basque Country. There are other historical regions, however, which have failed to follow suit. They have not gone down the same path of regionalization. So in Spain, we have a number of different players in this process. Essentially, however, we have an issue with our autonomous communities, and I'm drawing to a close now, William. What there is now, however, is bitter public criticism of the state structure because they believe that the regional structure is to a large extent responsible for the financial crisis in my country. We've been downgraded again by the Moody's rating agency. Again, they've downgraded Spanish sovereign debt. And Moody's are saying that the reason they have done so is because the autonomous communities have such large amounts of debt. And of course they do because they're responsible for for example, for welfare, social services, and education. It's the autonomous communities who are responsible for the provision of major public services, and they have seen their funding cut, and that is why they have had to take on more debt. So I think there's a twin-track process underway here, William. We've got the political process of regionalization, but for the first time in 30 years, we have got very strong criticism being leveled at our autonomous communities, at our regions, and certainly the the Spanish public is very upset about the way in which regions are handling the situation. We have had certain powers which have been devolved from the state to the autonomous communities. I've got, to, I think it's 9 minutes 45 seconds. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Amour. And I regret you only had uh, 10 minutes because I found your contribution so well researched and so interesting that I could listen to you for an awful lot longer and I think that goes for everybody here. So thank you very much. Now, uh, I now have a statement from our friend Mr. Van Sta, uh, President of the Regional Parliament of Tyrol. Uh, He's also president of the Chamber of the Regions. He's president of the Regional Parliament of Tyrol in Austria. And he's now going to give us the latest developments in his country. Mr. Van Staar, 10 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, President, the Austrian situation is characterized by the fact that we are a federal state. We have nine federal states with legislative powers, whereby one of these federal states is the city of Vienna, which is also um, a city. We see a similar situation in Germany when it comes to Berlin. So we have regions with legislative powers, but we also have a strong tendency towards um, centralized government. And this centralized tendency is supported by the political parties and also by um, reports published by the media. Having said this, we do not have any concerns because the Austrian constitution guarantees um, the status 
of the federal states and the constitution could only be changed through um, a, a referendum and through change to the legislation. And as the parliament is made up of representatives from the regions, um, I have absolutely no concerns. So um, if you read these media reports about regionalization in Austria, don't worry about them. You can, you can ignore them. And when we're talking about regionalization, um, arguments relating to cost and the role of the European Union are always um, presented by those who um, are against regionalization. And I find you just can't follow that, um, follow that argument because you cannot reduce this just to an argument about um, harmonizing legislation with European Union norms. But when you look to the European Union, um, you can really see new opportunities emerging for European regions. And for example, the creation of a European Association for uh, Territorial cooperation. This is a European grouping for European territorial. So you are seeing developments whereby regions can cooperate across borders to resolve um, shared concerns, shared issues. Just last week, a new European grouping was founded between Tyrol and South Tyrol Trentino in Italy and Trentino. No local authorities are involved um, in this, but this provides the opportunity for regions to deal with issues which relate to the competencies of regions. This is an extremely important institution. No, we're not saying that whole health systems should be become part of the, become the responsibility of these European groupings. But you can look to see how you can cooperate to um, have um, health centres cooperating. For example, if the necessary resources are in place. We've also got um, a type of parliament, we've got 12 people in that, representatives from each of the regions, we've got two people from um, the parliament there as well, and the heads of each of the regions are also represented there, and these share the chairmanship. And what's been achieved here, and this isn't just in Austria the case, but the fact is that the Brussels, uh, in Brussels, these European groupings have been included in a new um, regulation, and the opportunity has been presented for these European groupings to be opened up to um, states who are not members of the European Union, and this is particularly important in the context of the European partnership. So there's really things happening here, and we can make the developments in this sphere available to you. Another area where Austria is very active is the Danube Euro region. Upper Austria, Lower Austria, and Vienna are involved in this macro region. This is the second macro region to be recognized in the European Union, following on from the Baltic Sea macro region. So here we've also achieved a great deal, and I'm delighted that we have been so successful. 
Now, in all states, we are confronted with the same problems. Mr. Sanchez Amor has referred to this. Mr. Carey has referred to this. I've referred to this in a report in my report. We need to do everything we can so that our framework for regional democracy, which we approved here in the Congress, which we worked so hard on, that this is um, implemented on the basis of our monitoring. Of course, any member state of the Council of Europe or the EU can put together its regional systems as it wants. It has to, of course, adhere to the Charter of Local Self-Government and the Framework for Regional Democracy. Another important issue is multi-level governance, um, which we're going to talk about in our second round table. My colleague from Austria will talk to us about that in more depth. When it comes to subsidiarity, um, we have seen in, in, an increased role for regions with legislative powers. And we are seeing a changed relationship between the um, national government and the Bundesrat and the regions with legislative powers. We are seeing the president of the Bundesrat cooperating um, very closely together. And we see great opportunities for cooperation in the future here. Now, we have also seen programs when it comes to um, um, legislation at federal level. We have very competent um, Landtag president working here. We have several, for example, in Salzburg. Our colleague, Ms. Molstorm, is very active in Salzburg. There's going to be a conference of heads of government as well. So we've got the cooperation in place so that if a problem emerges between the federal states and the central government, if there are problems when it comes to contracts in line with our constitution, generally um, the federal states are able to um, agree on the process when it comes to agreeing on points here. We are seeing permanent developments when it comes to the monitoring reports. And it's not just here about um, identifying problems, but our aim is always to be in permanent contact so that we can find real solutions um, to make a really positive contribution to the life of our citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Van Staar. Uh, in view of the fact that our new government has mentioned local government reform in its program for government, I found your contribution very interesting and informative. And along with the Irish delegate here, we'll be going, taking back all that information. Now, I'm now pleased to welcome Professor Constanti Tintinos Samaras, who will also make a statement. Professor, Professor Tamaris is a substitute member of our independent group of experts on the European Charter of Local Self-Government. In 2008, the Congress prepared a monitoring report on Greece and made proposals to reform the organization of regions in Greece. That was recommendation 247 in 2008. We are looking forward to learning more about the recent reforms concerning the Greek regions and to hear your views on regionalization in Greece in general. Professor Tamaris, you have the floor. I won't repeat uh, the time, but we're looking forward to hear your contribution. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Alors, euh, je vais essayer de faire une euh, très brève présentation du changement, des derniers changements concernant la, euh, la collectivité territoriale de deuxième degré en Grèce. Euh, en général, euh, la, la décentralisation est, pré est prévue dans la constitution grecque. La constitution grecque prévoit que l'administration des affaires locales est, est du ressort de, de collectivités territoriales. Et il dispose qu'il y a collectivité territoriale du premier et du deuxième degré. Donc, euh, jusqu'à l'année 1994, il y avait un seul degré, et les municipalités et les communes. Until 1994, there was only one level of regional authorities, and in 1994, there were changes which provided for, as well as the first level, for regional authorities to be introduced, uh, which would say called second level regional, regional authorities. Sorry, these are authorities and these regional authorities are elected through a secret and direct universal suffrage. The constitution also specifies that regional authorities do enjoy financial and administrative autonomy. They therefore have the authority to take decisions uh, through the bodies that they create in these uh, matters. The Constitution also uh, provides for an administrative control that can be carried out over these regional authorities, and this control or inspection is only related to legality. As I was saying, up to 1994, there was only one level of regional authorities, and then there was a change, and for the very first time, the uh, new law ushered in the concept of second-level regional authorities, uh, so-called departmental decentralized administrations. And then, in last year, there was a further change with regard to second-level regional authorities. The new law, which dates, uh, therefore, to back to 2010, restructured the decentralization system and also the system of state devolution. The new law removed uh, the so-called departmental decentralized administrations, which were second-level regional authorities, and now the regions are second-level regional authorities. The, the only administrative devolved unit of the uh, state is now the so-called devolved administrative unit. The bodies that uh, manage or administer the regions, uh, that is the regional authorities, uh, second level regional authorities, and this has been since 2010, are the following ones. The regional council, the president of the regional council, the vice presidents of the regional council, and there are also consultative or advisory bodies such as the economic affairs committee and the executive committee. The regional council, the president of the regional council and the vice presidents are elected for a period of five years, which can be renewed, and this is once again uh, through direct uh, secret universal suffrage. As I was saying to you just now, the executive committee is made up of the president of the regional council and the vice presidents, and the, there are the advisory bodies, the economic affairs committee, which is composed of the president of the regional council and six to ten members of the regional council, and this is an advisory body for economic matters. In other words, the Economic Affairs Committee prepares the budget for the region, prepares the draft financial report for the end of the year, also prepares the text for contracts which will be signed by the President or the Vice Presidents of the Regional Council, and the Economic Affairs Committee also gives its opinion on bank loans requested by the region. With regard to the powers of the Regional Council, the difference uh, between the 1994 law and the new one is that in the past the law specified that the departmental administrations had general powers to manage 
matters at departmental level. Now, the law dating back to last year specifies the powers at regional level. This is the first time, in fact, that this has happened. There's a detailed list of the powers that the regional council enjoys, and the new law states that the powers of the regional council are in the following matters, that is, drafting regional development medium-term programs. These are programs that are either funded by the European Union or by the Greek state. And it's also responsible for matters dealing with farming, fisheries, energy, waters, mining, tourism, business, transport, communications, public works, environment, environmental protection, public health, sport, primary and secondary education, and civil protection. Now, all these powers that have just been mentioned cover local matters at regional level. It should also be stated that the President of the Regional Council has authority to apply the decisions of the Regional Council. He is the head of the services and staff in the region, and he's all responsible for publishing regulatory acts. Moving to the administrative control uh, that uh, ex carried out over the regions. Now, this uh, control relates to acts and also control over persons. First of all, this administrative supervisory uh, role is related to legal acts. Now, the new law created uh, a devolved administrative unit. Is created by the state, and this new law has set up a supervisory service, if you like, or bureau, and the director of this bureau is a so-called legality inspector. He is a senior civil servant who has a term of five years, and this uh, bureau is responsible for carrying out administrative controls on the region. The second level regional authorities are concerned in the region, of course, and so far as the devolved administrative unit at state level, there is a bureau which is charged uh, by the administrative authority to check the legality of the acts uh, taken by the region. The supervisory role is carried out by an ex officio review of the regulatory acts uh, on uh, public uh, procurement uh, and contracts and the uh, selling and purchasing of goods and, uh, lo and the loan contracts. And above and beyond these ex officio reviews, any person that has a legitimate interest can, uh, through a special administrative appeal, uh, request that certain checks be made on the regional bodies. So far as the reviews of contracts is concerned, any contract, the amount of which uh, exceeds 500,000 euros should uh, must obligatory be sent to the uh, Court of Auditors. The new law from 2010 ushered in a brand new system related to administrative uh, control over acts, uh, as I said, regulatory acts or contracts. Uh, and the second brand new characteristic of this law was uh, administrative control over persons or people. As I was saying, the control over acts is only a legality inspection, whereas the administrative control over persons is uh, carried out by the same uh, department, it's a supervisory department with the legality inspector who is the head of this department and checks will be carried out on uh, people and here for instance the director can force the president, vice uh, president uh, or the councillors to be uh, relieved of their duties for a period of six months if there has been a serious uh, uh, breach uh, in their duties in office uh, or for other reasons too. And findings can also be published uh, uh, which uh, can 
Without in the full dismissal of such a people, if there is an incompatibility, if uh, they is uh, being deprived of managing the state or civic rights, if they've been convicted of a crime or certain offences, this is explicitly provided for in the law, and the law does state the law in question states exactly what uh, scenarios uh, are covered for such dismissal to occur. Have I got one minute left? Is that it? No. One time is up. I just wanted to round off by saying that there is an ombudsman at regional level as well, and this is a, a new development. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I would like to hear more from you, Professor Tamaris. A pity we have more time, but I hope you understand. Uh, the time limits. Now, uh, the next speaker is Professor Francesco Palermo from Italy. He is the, the director of the Institute for the Study of Federalism and Regionalization in Balanzo and Bozan. Uh, I'm now pleased to give you the floor, uh, and uh, you are also a professor of comparative constitutional law at the University of Verona and a member of the independent group of experts on the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Italy is undergoing a comprehensive reform which will affect self-government. Constitutional changes are likely to group small municipalities and abolish the provinces. It will be very interesting to have your opinion on the recent reforms that have taken place in Italy. So now, Professor Palermo, you have the floor for 10 minutes also. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sehr geehrter Herr Präsident van Staal, lieber Herr. President van Staal, Director General. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're representing uh, the you director herself who is absent. to address this assembly uh, for the next uh, rather ten minutes, say uh, eight to nine minutes. I will uh, try to sketch out uh, some of the most uh, important challenges uh, that Italy is currently facing um, with regard to its uh, regionalization process. I will make essentially two points. Uh, one will be about uh, the Italian peculiarities as compared to uh, other federal, regional, decentralized countries. And the second one will be about the most relevant recent trends and, and possible evolutions that are going to be expected in Italy. So, uh, point number one, what is peculiar uh, to Italian regionalism? Well, I would say, um, like every uh, other federal or regional setting. Uh, also in Italy, regionalization is uh, a process and obviously also a very lively one. Uh, like many, not all, but many uh, other uh, systems, this evolution is not always consistent, uh, which is rather common. Uh, there are strong legal and factual social asymmetries uh, among the various regions, and uh, there is no uh, clear and generally shared uh, idea of where this process should lead, so where this should end. Like a few other countries, uh, interterritorial cooperation among the regions is not uh, very developed, so I would say there is a relatively little cooperative attitudes among, attitude among the territories. But what really makes the Italian case rather unique as compared to others is the uh, very quick uh, shift in priorities uh, about the regional 
project. Um, if I just uh, resume very briefly what has happened uh, over the last 20 years, uh, we can see the shifting in priorities in a really a number of points. Uh, it uh, started in the early 1990s, where uh, all was about increasing uh, political stability in the region, so uh, increasing efficiency. It was the time of efficient federalism, so to say. Then in the late 90s, it was really uh, about the competences, both in legislation and in administration. So that was the time of legislative and administrative federalism. Then this uh, process was not given enough time because uh, new priorities came in uh, through an important constitutional reform that took place in 2001. Uh, and there the focus was on constitutional design and division of, of powers. Uh, so the focus was on constitutional federalism. Uh, then in 2006, a very comprehensive constitutional reform was uh, adopted but was rejected then by popular referendum. And there the issue was essentially the representation of regions in the center, so institutional federalism, the issue of the Senate. Uh, and uh, as of 2006, up until now, the, uh, all seems to be about uh, financial relations, so the so-called fiscal federalism. So the point here is that uh, all these are obviously very important issues, uh, but none of them has been so far pursued with the necessary consistency. So that's probably the deficit. So what is the outcome of that is that the Italy is a rather a federal state on the paper, I would say, uh, with still a rather centralistic and not very cooperative political attitude. Uh, as it has been said in the literature, it is a kind of a federal state without federalism. So there is some uh, degree of inconsistency. But because structurally, uh, I would say all, if not, if not all, than most of the uh, uh, features that are common to established federal countries are there on the paper. You can think, for example, of the residual power clause, meaning that the regions can do everything which is not explicitly attributed to the state. There is no longer any preventive control by the state over regional legislation. Uh, regions have a treaty-making power. Uh, there are new by, uh, financial relations. Uh, uh, regions have a constitutional autonomy, which is quite developed, etc. But what is missing is the common understanding uh, of what federalism should be about. One could think of the example of the financial relations. Uh, there are at present two very diverging ideas uh, about this uh, uh, project. Uh, for some, this should uh, increase the competitiveness of regions and the competition among regions. For others, this should be a, an instrument of solidarity uh, between and among regions. So it is quite difficult, of course, to you know, reconcile these two things. Second point, uh, the main trends and the challenges to uh, be expected in the future. Now, 10 years have passed since the uh, constitutional reform uh, uh, took into force. Um, one could say that uh, in this uh, decade, uh, the potential of the constitutional reform has not been fully exploited. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, well, one is the fact that, paradoxically enough, the constitutional court, which used to be you know, a good ally of the regions in uh, affirming their competences, has recently turned into a sort of a, a stumbling block of the regions. So it is, practically speaking, for the regions much more difficult now to win a case in front of the constitutional court. Uh, the regions also bear some responsibility. Uh, most of them have adopted the new autonomy statutes, I mean, uh, with a constitutional reform, unlike in, unlike in Spain, uh, but uh, they have been not really creative in exploiting and in seizing the opportunities that were given by the reform. Um, two main issues are on the agenda. Uh, one, as I said, is the issue of fiscal federalism, namely the financial relations. The implementation has been speedy, uh, but because of the different expectations on the outcome, uh, the legislation implementing this provision is still a little contradictory, so everyone can read uh, into this what actually he or she wants to read in it. 
so it needs still some clarification. <coughs> The second point is the debate on the reform of the Senate, so the institutional uh, relations, which has been also mentioned by President uh, Van Sta. Um, this is a very high uh, point in the political agenda, uh, and, uh, but nevertheless it doesn't seem likely that a constitutional reform will be adopted on that. Uh, currently it is uh, discussed in Parliament an interesting draft bill uh, which uh, tries to uh, reorganize and uh, rationalize the system of cooperation uh, at governmental level between regions, municipalities, the provinces if they will remain, but it seems likely that they uh, won't be uh, taken out so easily. Um, so this draft bill can introduce some elements of uh, simplification and uh, streamlining the whole process. To conclude, uh, as I said in the outset, it uh, uh, has been a process and obviously it will continue to be a, a process. No big constitutional reform is uh, really to be expected in the near future. Uh, so this makes it uh, eventually more likely that uh, more continuity will be given to priorities, that they will not be abandoned uh, very soon, uh, as it has been the case in the past, and also that uh, hopefully more consistency will be uh, given to the implementation of these priorities. Uh, thank you very much, and I stand at your uh, disposal for further questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Palermo. I must say, we, those of us of the present generation are living in, through interesting times and we're looking at very interesting changes in the future and we must keep, it's great to be able to keep an eye on what's taking place in various countries. Now, my next speaker is uh, Mr. Bartolomej Ostrowski from Poland, Director of the Unit for International Cooperation and Projects of the Marshal's Office of Lower Silesia. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce him. He will now give us an overview of regionalization in Poland with the European framework. He will also draw his experience as head of Lower Silesia in Brus the Brussels office, an advisor for cooperation with Poland in the office of the Minister President in Saxony. Mr. Astorowski, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy uh, to speak after two colleagues from Spain and Italy because Poland is uh, very similar case, uh, also in the process of decentralization, like in the process of European integration. We, how to say, follow the, 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 the way of Italy and Spain. The, the, the subject, the topic of our debate is recent development, but please allow me to, uh, to draw you an attention on the, on the global process of the decentralization in Poland. Uh, the history of decentralization uh, sta has started in Poland uh, recently, 1990, after Poland became democratic. And uh, indeed it was the first reform uh, made by the new non-communist uh, Polish government. Uh, in the year 1990, we created the municipalities. Mm. Uh, and it was the so-called first wave of decentralization. The second one was delivered in 1998, and then we created uh, <coughs> districts or counties and regions. And nowadays we do have three levels of uh, self-government, municipality, district, and, and region. Uh, the system is still in the transition. Uh, and. Uh, I was uh, surprised hearing from the colleague from Italy that the Italy this, in Italy the system also is in the transition. We are not uh, alone in this, uh, in this case. Uh, the system is very unbalanced because uh, the municipalities are the strongest element of the system because they are better established 
because of the, of the history, due to the history, they exist longer than the district and regions. And in many, many cases, municipalities are stronger than districts and regions, what is quite surprisingly. Uh, maybe we do have two small uh, entities at the level of district and, and regions. Uh, a part of this, uh, this is also very interesting to draw your attention on the relation between central government and the self-governments. Uh, first of all, uh, that's the, the, the issue that uh, the central government transfers the task to the regional level uh, only then, then when the central government is not able to manage on their own. Uh, for example, mm, central government transferred the task of health system, railway uh, system, uh, and the second aspect is uh, transfer of tasks without financial uh, uh, support. That's a big problem for the regional structures. Uh, this is also a tension, especially during the time of financial crisis. My colleague from Spain has already mentioned this, uh, this topic. Uh, on the one hand, the central government uh, is trying to, to stop the, the uh, process of making public debts at the regional level. On the second uh, uh, hand, the central government is trying to, uh, to uh, relocate at the public spending on the regional level. Uh, in, in case of Poland, mm, we do have the limit of the public debts at the regional level. This is allowed to, to make a debt only uh, up to the 55% um, of the total budget. But the most Polish regions uh, uh, doesn't, uh, don't, don't have such a high uh, limit of debt. For example, my region, Lower Silesia, uh, has 38% uh, of uh, uh, of debts in compared to the total budget. Uh, I would like to draw your attention on the uh, very interesting phenomenon, um, the meaning of European Union funds for the region. This is fundamental uh, because uh, if you compare then Polish regions, they do have twice so much money, European money, to to spend for the regional development than the own money. It means the European Union has fundamental meaning, fundamental importance for Polish regions. And actually, the, uh, initially, the idea of decentralization, creating a region, was linked to the European integration uh, process. Uh, and that's the big question for the Polish region, what would happen after, uh, uh, after financial support from European Union? It means after uh, uh, then the, the Polish regions will phase out from the objective one regions. In those cases, we need uh, other idea for the, for the regions. It means more own competencies, more own financial resources, uh, uh, more orientation on the regional development and building on the regional identity, not only to be a tool for the implementing of the uh, EU structure policy. Uh, please uh, allow me also to uh, mention one, one point. Uh, concerning this unbalanced system. Uh, we do have lack of the um, regulation for agglomeration. Indeed, the small municipality with a uh, uh, couple of thousand inhabitants and the big agglomeration are in the same uh, framework in the legal point of view. And therefore, uh, this is a need to uh, improve the system in the case for creating the special regulation for 
agglomeration. Uh, of course, Poland will remain unitary state. Uh, this is no discussion, no debate about federal system. This is absolutely is, uh, excluded. But uh, it might be a system, unitary system, with the very strong, uh, very strong position of self-government. And uh, this development uh, might be delivered, hopefully, in the uh, years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosky. Two little things I picked up. One was uh, the central government imposing tasks without the necessary financial backup. That ring, that's a familiar ring to it for, for us. And the second thing is uh, what happens when uh, the EU funding diminishes? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you have some problems. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, now, my next speaker is Mr. Sergi Marasov, Marasov from the Russian Federation, and he's the governor of the Ulanskov region. I give you the floor, Mr. Marasov. Now, and uh, as you come to the floor, I'd like to inform the members you have been governor of the Ulanskov region since 2004. You were also mayor of the town of Demetrograd, and you are therefore familiar with both local and regional issues of the possible interactions between these two levels of government. We shall be pleased to listen to your contribution on the re recent developments of regionalization in the Russian Federation. Mr. Marasov, you have the floor. Uh, Thank you very much, President, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, of course, I would like to thank the Chamber of the Regions and its President, Dr. Van Star, for the opportunity to speak today in this forum. Of course, this issue is a very interesting one for us. And you can say when you look at Russian regions, we have started a process of a new type, um, a new type of regionalization from below in a horizontal man man uh, manner, you could say regionalization in a European style. And I'm going to present what this means for my region. I'm going to talk about regionalization in Russia, and I'm going to focus on three areas. Now, first of all, the new institutional forms, which um, grant a new role um, to the re regions in the process of uh, modernization. Now, in our region, we have got together to, to create a council of regional and local authorities. Now, this group's together representatives of the legislative and the executive branch, as well as representatives from municipalities, from the society chamber, from the council of municipalities, and also experts. This provides us with the opportunity to exchange opinions with all um, structures, to work together to find common positions, including on controversial issues. Now, during the council session, we enjoy the participation of representatives um, from federal ministries and departments, members of the State Duma, and this provides us with the opportunity to communicate our concerns um, to the federal center and the position of the regions on certain issues. Now, also, we are paying particular attention to protecting the rights and freedoms of citizens and legal entities. In Russia, we have three ombudsman institutions, one on human rights, one on the rights of the child, and one um, to protect the rights of investors. In Ulyanovsk, we have gone even further than this, and we have created specialized ombudsman institutions. So in addition to the three ombudsmen I've already mentioned, in my region we also have an ombudsman who is responsible for combating corruption, one who protects the rights of entrepreneurs, and a further ombudsman who is responsible for citizens' concerns when it comes to communal housing facilities. All the regional ombudsmen work together in a state institute which is called the 
the Chamber of Fairness. Now, the aim is clear to have a better understanding of those sore points um, relating to violations of rights and the freedoms of our citizens and to work to effectively help them. We work together with the judiciary to resolve their issues. Now, furthermore, um, our ombudsman also has a network of assistance in local authorities. Now, I'd like to note that those new institu uh, institutions who are working to resolve the problems of our citizens are grouped together at interregional level. Um, in Ulyanovsk, we have a um, we are an important center for the aviation industry, and in this sphere, we have studied European experience, and we have also um, created a consortium working together at regional level as well as with European partners. And every year, we organize an international aviation forum. Now, now, as we understand that the problems of the aviation industry cannot be resolved by one region alone, we have signed an interregional agreement on trade, economic and social cultural cooperation in the sphere of aviation. And there are five regions have signed up to that. We also work we've also created a not-for-profit organization. It's called the Association of Aviation Regions. Now, the aim of this is to um, create common business projects to um, support their progress at federal level. Now on to my second point. This is the positioning of different regions, in particular Ulyanovsk, as a center for interregional and international cooperation. I'm going to present three examples from the experience of my region. The first is the development and the support of small business. Now, as you know, this is a very topical issue, not just in my region, but in Russian as a whole. Just last year in our region, we registered nearly 12.5 thousand new SMEs, and this has led to the creation of more than 20,000 new jobs. So what are the results which we can see here? We have changed our regional law. We have broadened the opportunities for entrepreneurs to register um, patents from 60 to 69 different types. Startups have the opportunity to pay um, for a pa patent in the first year. They just pay 20 euros. We have also established a minimum tax rate and introduced a whole range of measures of financial support, grants, subsidies, state guarantees, microloans, and so on. So as a result of this, today in our region, we consider our, we have a platform for Russian-Italian um, cooperation a working group um, in the industrial sphere for SMEs. We've also got a Russian-French working group um, for cooperation in the aviation industry and a Russian-German working group which works on strategic cooperation when it comes to the economy and finance. Now, the second example is strengthening um, international intercultural links. Ulyan Ulyanovsk is a very ethnically diverse region. We have more than 100 ethnic groups living in our region. We we have local newspapers published in different languages. Pupils in schools learn local languages. And we are also working hard to support education. As a result, we are able to resolve conflicts, um, inter-ethnic conflicts. Anyone who comes to our region will feel very at home. Every year, we organize national festivals. And these include European and Asian um, festivals. We have good, friendly relations with many countries throughout the world. Now, the third example is the, our use of European experience. For example, the European Cultural Capitals Program. On the basis of this experience, um, 14 
of the experience of 14 countries, we created a program, the cult cultural capitals of the CIS. At the end of September, we had a conference in Ulyanovsk on culture as a result as a resource for modernization and with the participation of the general director of the Directorate for Education, Culture and Heritage, Youth and Sport, the Council of Europe, Ms. Batani Dragoni. And currently, we, the president is, the, there is a presidential decree in preparation on the International Cultural Forum in Ulyanovsk. We are also um, seeing um, changes in a third area relating to decentralization, and this is a very important issue for us. I'd like to present my position on this. Now, the transfer of power is not a goal in itself. The aim is to improve the quality of life for our citizens and to improve the competitiveness of the region. On the other hand, you need an effective approach um, when it comes to stimulating um, the work of municipalities and to get greater tax revenues to optimize budget expenditure. We are working on a whole system of agreements with municipalities to make our work more effective. Now, of course, we can only um, so resolve these issues if we work together at local level, at regional level, and at national level, particularly when it comes to, uh, to um, repairing housing um, and reforming the health service. And these are issues which were neglected for 40 years, and it is the policies of Mr. Putin which have made it possible to resolve these issues. Now, of course, there are issues which still need um, work. We need to look at our legislation to increase more, to introduce more flexibility into that, and a whole series of our laws need to be clarified um, very soon. We will hear the results of a working group um, created by the president to deal with this issue. So we are working to maintain a stable dialogue. So I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Well, Mr. Marozov, thank you very much. You certainly paint a beautiful picture of your province and region and <laughs> makes one feel I would like to visit it. And I wish you the best of luck with the program that you have commenced and I hope we'll all see it through. Thank you very much. It was most interesting. Now, uh, my next uh, speaker is Mrs. Annelise Dark from Sweden. Now, we had hoped that our Swedish colleague, Mr. Rune O. Aldergren, could be, have been with us today. Unfortunately, for health reasons, he cannot be present. We wish him a speedy recovery. His communication will be presented by Mrs. Annelise Dark from the Swedish delegation. And I look up forward, and we look forward to your contribution on the latest developments, on the la or sorry, the last developments of regionalisation in Sweden. Please, Mrs. Stark, take the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to share some experiences. Sweden has a historic tradition of a strong local and regional level. Today, there is 290 local authorities, municipalities and cities, and 31 regional authorities, county councils. The local and regional authorities have the right to levy taxes, to finance their duties. Some obligations are regulated by legislation, but there is an additional right for the municipalities and the country council to decide on further duties which they consider important for the population. The regional authorities' boundaries goes back to the 17th century. The geographic boundaries has been discussed for many years, a huge reformation took place in the late 90s when several counties merged into larger regions in the southern and west part of Sweden. 
These regions accepted additional duties previously handled by the government at regional level. In 2007, a committee appointed by the government proposed several reforms considering the regions. More responsibilities should be handled at regional level. The region should be constituted by several criteria on, for example, size of populations. The government, however, decided to postpone this process. The government chose to recommend the regional authorities to have their own processes on how they create a new regions would turn out. Today, this discussion is still ongoing. Right now, this process is quite existing, since regions wanting to merge with other regions must declare this to the government latest end of this year. This strategy might lead to large and powerful regions in some parts of the county and smaller regions in other parts. In other parts, it is difficult to move ahead. Despite these ongoing discussions, it is clear that the regional level gains importance and new responsibilities to create their own solutions based on the local needs. One of the challenges is that the government has appointed another committee looking into the government authorities' regional organization. And after the next election in 2014, we might see the results of all the different processes that are ongoing just now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Stark. And I would just say, you're a hard act to follow uh, and a good substitute for any speaker. And I'd like to hear more from you at other stages. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I'd like now to thank all the speakers for their interesting contributions this morning. And uh, I'd like to compliment the people who selected those speakers from the various countries showing the various forms of regionalization that they're hoping to institute. It's well done to all who organized them. So uh, I now wish to open the debate to the floor. And uh, I have one uh, request. Mr. Andrew Boff from the UK, come along. And you have, <coughs> yes, Mr. Where's Mr. Bob? Can you, will you speak there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, th I think from the UK we come from, we have a different history with regard to regional government. Uh, we don't really have it. Um, and, uh, and we haven't had it until recently when the four nations of uh, the United Kingdom um, a few years ago decided to have their own, uh, their own regional governments with the exception of the largest of those nations and that is uh, England. And in England there was only really, uh, since, since uh, that time, there's only really been one region set up with, which is democratically accountable, and that is uh, the London region, uh, of, of, uh, on, uh, and I, I sit on the London Assembly of that particular region. Um, but coming from that history of, of not having regional governments, uh, we have a slightly different perspective on how regions should in future be designed and it seems to me that in most countries the, the, in most countries the development of regions is a very top-down affair. Basically the governments decide that they want a regional structure for their own administrative convenience and we then spend many years of conflict between the regions and the municipalities, both of whom ha uh, think that they are the top dogs. 
um, and it's not unusual for there to be many disputes. Uh, perhaps people sitting on a regional body would find that the municipalities are too parochial, and those sitting on municipalities think the regional, uh, regional uh, politicians aren't paying any attention to their particular local circumstances. And I don't think that's an unfamiliar feeling throughout Europe. Um, in the UK, we've taken a different approach quite recently in terms that we've decided, rather than the government deciding where the regions are going to be, we actually think that it should be the people and the municipalities themselves, along with local businesses, to decide what the best regional structure is for them for future regional development. And in doing so, we've set up, uh, the government of the UK have set up local enterprise partnerships and local enterprise partnerships are not imposed by the government. They are the choice of the municipalities to get into arrangements between other, in other, with other municipalities for whom they feel they have a common economic or development interest. So effectively, this is design your own region type of uh, philosophy. And it's one that's uh, considerably, uh, it is well supported because it gets rid of the conflict that there is between municipalities and regions because the municipalities are in the driving seat of that regional structure. I also th I think Europe needs to pay attention to this, or the European Union, this is not the European Union admittedly, but the European Union needs to pay attention to this because the British government tends to al allocate European funds through this structure and it's a structure that can actually change and, and, as I say, with municipalities in the driving seat. And we've got to think about more bottom-up reorganisation of our government and not always assume that it's the central government that knows best how to organise our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buff. Now, the next speaker is Mr. Bergman. And uh, we must limit you to two minutes, if possible. Thank you very much. I will do my best to keep it brief. Uh, I'm going to respond to what Mr. Sanchez Amor said, because he has been active in Germany as part of the monitoring process. I'm a member of a parliament in Turingen. This is a regional parliament with legislative powers. And Mr. Sanchez and Moore said that there are certain trends which are now discernible in Germany, whereby there is a move towards more centralization. Well, I would repudiate that assertion. The Lisbon tra Treaty specifically recognizes us as a regional parliament with legislative powers vis-à-vis -vis our national parliament. We are able to negotiate treaties and we have a right of co-decision in the second chamber of parliament. We have taken certain decisions along those lines in Parliament, and so I just want to specifically say that I do not recognize his characterization of Germany as such, and I would like to thank Mr. Van Staar and our Austrian colleagues as well, because I think that they too have taken similar decisions, and Germany and Austria are taking action at regional parliamentary level to counter any such moves. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Krug. And I'm told two minutes, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Along with my colleague, Mr. Bergman, I also uh, listened quite uh, carefully to what Ignacio was saying, and I wanted to respond to this. But uh, in a broader context, I hope I'll be able to do this within the two minutes allotted speaking time. I come from a, a central uh, state, uh, which uh, in 1990 finally uh, started to usher in regionalization, and we have uh, did this in the context 
context of the new federal states in Germany. And we've had quite a difficult uh, process of regionalization and development of the democratic bodies in uh, Germany. But this has been initiated. And I would like to say that the cooperation between these strong uh, regions and the weaker regions is something that has helped us make enormous headway. In the meantime, we've had a federal re federalism reform, and Ignacio, I can't say that we have a stronger centralization. We have it in quite, in fact, quite the opposite. We have more decentralization now. We have decentralization in terms of social affairs, in terms of education, in terms of media. But when it comes to financial matters, we have a slightly stronger central centralized role. This is also, of course, linked to the debt crisis. But what I would like to say, generally speaking, is that we do have very clearly delineated tasks between the regions and very clearly demarcated tasks uh, at a federal level, what the government uh, would uh, be responsible for. But of course, all these would be done in consultation and in support uh, with the different regions as a whole system for compensating uh, debts and so on and so forth. And I think this is something that should certainly be emphasized here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Crewe. Now, uh, Mrs. Romanafa, two minutes. Thank you, President. Well, this really is a very interesting discussion looking at issues relating to regionalization and decentralization. These are very topical issues for us in Ukraine, these being discussed in national platforms of associations. It's been identified as one of the priorities for the work of the President of Ukraine. And I can tell you that today we have have a basic level, local authorities in place. We have 25 regions, and then we have the federal state, and of course the autonomous region of Crimea, so 24 regions and then Crimea, which has a special status. Now, the powers are defined in our legislation, and today in Ukraine we are having a discussion on the future development for our administrative reform. A certain number of measures have been adopted, and changes were carried through a few years ago, although these weren't very successful, and now we are learning from European experience, we are examining very closely those issues which we are discussing here today, and I think in the near future we'll be able to see real results. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Romanafa. Now, our last speaker is Mrs. Muelo Muller. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much. President, my question is directed to Mr. Tsimaras. Mr. Tsimaras talked at some considerable length about the reform, the scrapping of the second tier of government and new powers for the region. And this is something that we have seen are far too vast. My question is how, again, Against the backdrop of the financial crisis in Greece, given that regions were granted certain powers in 2010, specifically how are they going to go about exercising their powers in the climate of the financial crisis? Yeah. Sorry, time is against us, so I have no more speakers. But uh, those who were not here didn't, because of time, could not get to speak in the time available. Would you hand in your typed contributions to room 1081 for reproduction in the summary record? Now, Mr. Sanchez Amour, do you wish to reply to any of the points raised in today's debate? And I'm sorry, but you only have five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Ah, oui. Ok. Eh, sí, eh, brevemente. Yo creo que ha habido un problema Very de briefly. I think there was possibly an interpretation problem there. I didn't say that there was a centralizing tendency. I'm very, very familiar with the Federal Republic of Germany, and I'm actually a constitutional uh, law uh, expert, so I know what I'm talking about. Rather, what I said is that Germany has a deeply entrenched federal system. However, there is some recent case law coming out from the Constitutional Treaty which has made it possible for federal institutions to take decisions. I am aware of just how capable regional parliaments are in Germany, and they have a financial and political powers, but there are certain limits, of course, because in some instances they require the authorization of the Bundesrat, which is a federal body. So I was talking not, only, not, not so much about centralization, rather that there are sometimes difficulties created by the Bundesrat. So I specifically want to direct that remark to my German colleagues. I mean, it may have been a translation issue. It's not that I was saying that Germany is some kind of a centralized system. Rather, I was saying that in a deeply federal system, the political climate within which we have been operating in recent years has not led to further waves of devolution uh, in the same way as we saw in the 1990s. Indeed, in the 2006 reform, the the powers of the Bundesrat were to a certain extent delimited. It's a little bit technical, it's a political point though, so just rest assured, German colleagues, I know very well how the federal system works, and certainly my work in the monitoring uh, committee is not uh, affected by that. I, I have a, a very thorough understanding of the German system. Thank you, Mr. Amor. No. Uh, I'd just like to repeat, anybody who felt they couldn't get in, would you make a written contribution and hand it in to room 1081? Because I was a victim myself of that situation yesterday. <coughs> now, I suggest uh, that the Bureau of the, the next Bureau decide on how the issues raised and this important debate should be followed up. And I'll just conclude my remarks by saying I think it was the most important and interesting debate that I have been involved in or taken part in in the past year in the chamber. And again, compliment the staff for organising the speakers. And ladies and gentlemen, the debate is now closed. <coughs> Thank you. Uh,